So today, let us first start by focusing on X-rays. Okay. Now, as you know, this is the higher energy or the higher frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we are now focusing on today in terms of the channels of different kinds of astronomical information that astronomers use to study the universe. Now, what are X-rays? Just to remind you once again, that the wavelengths are in the range of 10 to the power of minus six to 10 to the power of minus nine centimeters. Uh, you can see it over here, uh, where the wavelength is given uh, first in meters, then in centimeters. And you can see it from about 10 to the power of minus six to 10 to the power of minus nine. When you go to even shorter wavelengths, then you go to the Kamari region. And as you know, the waves are actually, there's no sharp boundary. Uh, there would be a continuous uh, change in frequencies or wavelengths. So you might find slightly different numbers depending upon the text that you use. Uh, and uh, one should also note that these uh, difference in numbers is also partly due to the difference in techniques which are used to measure X-rays and gamma rays or, at, or even at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's no hard boundary, but there is a reasonable sort of boundary over there. And when you look at the frequency, this is greater than about 3 to 10 to the power of 19 hertz. Okay, The gamma rays, you can see it over here where the, where the frequency has been listed. Whereas in the case of X-rays, it's about 10 to the power of 16, somewhere from here, uh, to somewhere about 10 to the power of 19 hertz. And then the gamma rays take over. You can also look at the energies, because E is nothing but H nu where H is Planck's constant. And you can see over here that X-rays go from 124. These numbers are just because the numbers I've chosen over here. There's nothing sacrosanct about one, two, four precisely into 1.2 into 10 to the power of five electron volts. And the gamma rays are higher than that. To get a sense of the energies that one is talking about at high energies, you all know what an electron volt is, that if you compare a radio photon, which is at a wavelength of one centimeter, okay, that's three to 10 to the power of 10 Hertz, then the energy of the photon is merely about 1.2 into 10 to the power of minus four electron volts. So you can see that in the boundary region between the X-rays and the gamma rays, that these photons are actually more energetic by a factor of about 10 to the power of nine or so. So you're really talking about much more energetic photons than the low energy part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And even if you look at the optical infrared part where I've just picked up a number of 10 to the power of minus four centimeters, which is about 10,000 angstroms, which is just beyond the red end of the spectrum, moving on to the infrared part, then the energy you will get is about 1.2 electron volts. So even that you can see is about five orders of magnitude larger. So when we're talking of X-rays and gamma rays, we are talking of photons, which are far more energetic, right? That is something which you must always remember. So these are, when you detect the source in X-rays and gamma rays, you're basically detecting some of the most energetic or exotic objects in the universe. So let's have a look at how this came about and and what are the physical processes? X-rays, as you did learn from your basic physics and also from your general reading, that it was discovered rather serendipitously by William Ronchin while he was experimenting with cathode ray tubes. And Ronchin's rays were typically in the range of 30 to 50 kilo, kilo electron volts. So as I mentioned, these are highly energetic photons. Thousands of times more energetic than that of optical. So basically, X-rays is high energy astrophysics. A famous picture of Ronchin is, 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 a, is his wife's hand wearing perhaps a wedding ring over there. And as you can see from this picture that X-rays will go through um, material at low atomic numbers. So for example, flesh is water, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon. And you can see these are low, low uh, atomic numbers and the X-rays just pass through. 
And when you go to high atomic numbers, for example, the bone would be calcium z equal to 20, and the gold ring, which is uh, she's wearing, which is absolutely dark, you can see, is darker than the bones of her day. Atomic number of 79. So X-rays get blocked, and uh, and we've learned earlier as well that to make observations at uh, X-rays at these high energies, the atmosphere actually blocks all the photons from reaching the Earth, and you will have to go outside the atmosphere. But this discovery of Ronchin actually had immediate recognition that of its medical benefits. And even within a year after his discovery that um, medical applications uh, started off, some were making outrageous claims, but, but, the, but the utility of trying to use X-rays for medical purposes began to be realized quite early on. And Ronchin was awarded the first Nobel Prize in 1901 for his discovery of this of X-rays. Now, astronomically, the sun was known to be a strong X source of X-ray emission in the 1940s. This was observed using V2 rockets after World War II, led by Herbert Friedman at the Naval Research Laboratory in the US. Now, I want you to tell me why do you think the sun emits prominently at X-rays when we have all we have been seeing about stars so far is that it has surface temperature from maybe a couple of thousand, a few thousand to a few tens of thousands, and our sun is only close to about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, as one of you mentioned earlier. Now then why is the sun emitting prominently at X-rays when if you apply Wien's displacement law, you would find that it should only, it should peak at the optical region of the spectrum. So can any one of you unmute and tell me why? So Go ahead, Ananya. Maybe the corona of the sun. That, the, corona, that's the corona of the sun. Excellent, Ananya. So that is, and so the corona emits at X-ray wavelengths. Now, why does the corona emit at X-ray wavelengths? Because X-rays are uh, X-rays are really at a high energy, so you need uh, higher temperatures to emit uh, okay. higher high, gases at higher temperature to emit X-rays. Okay. So because the the so corona of the sun, uh, the, the surface is rather cooler than the corona of the sun, but it's, it's a very hot gas, so it can probably emit. Okay, so what do you think is the temperature of the corona? I'm not sure of the number, probably nine to 10,000 Kelvin. Okay, um, okay, okay. Aninya, you, your answer was right uh, in terms of the corona, but the temperature is way above that. Uh, this is a picture of the sun taken by a Japanese satellite called Yoko. Yoko is the Japanese word for sunbeam. And this has been taken in by the satellite in the soft X-ray part of the spectrum. So while I, while I use the word soft, let me also define what I mean by soft, that energies in X-rays also cover a very wide range. So usually 0.1 to 10 is referred, kilo electron volts is referred to as soft X-rays and from 10 to about 120 kilo electron volts is referred to as hard X-rays. And the sun is surrounded by a corona and the temperature is over a million degrees Kelvin. And, and, and an understanding of how the corona gets heated to high temperatures is still a matter of uh, research, but there have been various suggestions of how um, energy released by various processes on the surface of the sun go on to heat uh, the corona, but the corona is extremely hot. It's over a million degrees Kelvin. So, so although, but what happened with the detection of uh, X-rays from the sun was that it also began to be realized that, uh, that, the, that if you really put the sun, the, the amount of luminosity that you're seeing in X-rays at uh, distances of average stars, that the X-ray emission would be very weak. So although the sun was known as an X-ray emitter in the 40s itself due to the rocket flights, uh, people actually didn't expect very much to happen uh, because uh, the luminosity would be, given the luminosity of the sun, the amount of flux you would expect in the X-ray region from normal stars like the sun would be extremely low. 
So, but one of the things which, which did take off was to look for X-rays, which could be reflected off the moon. And that became particularly important because if even energetic particles are bouncing off the moon, uh, irradiating it, and you're able to detect some of it, then there was an attempt to understand what the surface of the moon might be, and particularly with uh, the American sort of mission uh, in the 60s to put a man on the moon. Okay. And that was one of the early experiments. And, and the sky is so, so rich that even if your objectives are different, you come up with exciting results. It was in June 1962 that Ricardo Giacconi and his collaborators and Bruno Rossi from MIT, uh, Giacconi and his collaborators were at the American Science and Engineering Corporation. They flew a set of large Geiger counters. Okay, uh, You'd have learned about in physics about the Geiger counters, where it reacts to high energy photons and charged particles, and they get detected by these counters. They put them about aboard a rocket uh, to look at X-rays reflected by the moon. They did not see any X-rays from the moon, but they did find, in addition to diffuse X-rays, a source, prominent source towards the constellation Scorpius. And you can see over here that uh, given the technology available at that time in the 60s, where Geiger counters were um, flown to, to detect sort of uh, X-rays from the moon, that the resolution is very poor. This was the response they got. So the peak is not towards the moon, but the peak was towards the, towards the source in the constellation Scorpius. And this was the first source uh, in the Scorpius constellation, and it was called SCO X1. Later, more accurate positions are determined, and then an optical counterpart was found. And it was found that this source, which is a powerful source of X ray emission, was associated with a rather faint star. We haven't uh, discussed the scale of magnitudes, but 13 magnitude mm -hmm. would be not a very faint star, but definitely. As I mentioned over here, several hundred times fainter than the faintest star that the eye can see. And if you want to know how nondescript or innocuous or run of the mill star this was, that if you took us one degree square in the sky, okay, as you know, the moon subtends in the angle of about 30 arc minutes. So if you took a one degree square, uh, area in the sky, there would be about 100 stars brighter than SCO X1. SCO X1, as we just mentioned, is the, was the source which was found by Ricardo Giacconi and his collaborators. Now, obviously this was something which was very exotic, very unexpected, and it was a reward for exploring the unknown. Nobody actually at that point realized that there would be such powerful X-ray sources in the sky. Then, before we go further, I just want to mention that while, while Ricardo Giacconi and his collaborators were trying to detect X-rays from the moon, they did not, but this is an image taken by a satellite much later. This was an uh, image taken in 1990, I think, uh, and by the Ronchin satellite, ROSAT, named after the discoverer of X-rays, William Ronchin, and this was operating, as you can see, in the soft band, which is 0.1 to 2 keV. Okay. And this is the Rosette image of the moon. So what are the key features? If I looked at this image and you thought about it, uh, what would be the key features that you would like to highlight? So any one of you can unmute and speak. I want you to be thinking and not quiet. It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. So, uh, I don't know the reason, but half of it has more X-ray emission. Okay. Why, half of it has more X-ray emission. Uh, so, why do you think that could happen? Maybe, maybe it's the side that faces the sun. Excellent. That's the side of the face. It's the same yeah. way that when you see the moon in visible light, you don't always see the full moon, do you? It goes through phases depending upon what 
which part is reflecting the sunlight towards you, isn't it? So similarly, you can see that there is intense X-ray emission detected from the part which is reflecting, facing the sun and reflecting the X-rays towards the observatory, Rosette, right? Now, what else can you see over here? So in this image, what you can see is the pixel brightness, which corresponds to X-ray intensity. Okay. So as uh, Ananya correctly pointed out, that a bright lunar surface reflects X-rays from the sun, similar to reflection of sunlight by the moon. And the dark hemisphere is the one which is not reflecting the light, but you can see that it is also not totally dark. There are few spots over there. And what those spots are telling you is that it is possible that energetic particles in the solar wind, because the sun, uh, as Anani again pointed out today, there is a corona, but there is also a solar wind, the high energy particles, which are coming out of the sun continuously. And the solar wind, if these, some of these high energy particles or cosmic ray particles, hit the lunar surface and irradiate it, and you may, some of the excited atoms may generate X-rays. So it is not, it could be, it could be uh, possibly energetic particles which are responsible for something. But what you also see is that there is a lot of emission outside the moon. Okay. So this is a diffuse X-ray background which exists, which also was noted by Giacconi et al. when they sent this uh, rocket up and they detected Scorpius X1, okay, that uh, there's a diffuse X-ray background. But here the resolution was not good enough to really be able to uh, resolve it out. And from more recent observations, for example, the Chandra X-ray telescope, which we will meet later, that we know that these are nothing but active galactic nuclei. We'll learn more about active galactic nuclei uh, in a later class, but you can see that the X-ray sky is actually very rich. Uh, just as the radio window when it was opened up, a lot of new objects were discovered. Similarly, in the X-ray region also, uh, once it started opening up with the accidental discovery of SCO X1, when you were merely trying to look at reflected X-rays from the moon, opened up a completely new era of looking at, at the universe. Now, what is the nature of SCO X1? That was very unclear, except that there was a very faint 13 magnitude star, uh, not very faint compared to what is possible today with modern telescopes and detectors, but relatively faint in the sense that there were hundreds of stars, thousands of stars, which are of similar magnitude or similar brightness. But it's, uh, but it, uh, but the nature became clear with the discovery of another object called Centaurus X3. And you can see how bright SCO X1 is by looking at the scan of the sky. By This was by a rocket in 1967. This is only for about three minutes or so, 180 seconds. And you can see that SCO X1 really sort of shines up. It's, it's, it's among the brightest uh, sources in this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, how, do we, how did we find out about uh, the nature of SCO X1? And why is it such a powerful emitter of X-rays when we know that the sun is a relatively weak emitter, but we know, as Ananya pointed out, that the X-ray emission from the sun is due to emission from the solar, solar corona, which is over a million degrees Kelvin. Now, Centaurus X3, this is the third X-ray source towards the constellation Centaurus. That is how it got its name, third X-ray source in the constellation Centaurus. And this was, uh, this, this was detailed studies were possible by observations which were made by the Uhuru satellite. So launched from Kenya and Uhuru is the Swahili word for freedom. And what they found from long observations was that this X-ray source was pulsating, okay? There was a 4.8 second period at which these, you could see these pulses. And the pulses were not at a very fixed frequency, but they were also 
shifting about in frequency. We suggest that the source emitting the X-rays were in motion. They were moving about with a certain velocity V. And it was again realized later by looking at the light curves and more detailed studies of this object that it was in a binary system. Okay? And the binary system had an orbital period of about 2.1 days. So what is happening is that there are two stars over there and they're moving about the common center of mass of the system. The neutron star, then it was found that, the, that one way to explain it, or perhaps the only way to understand it, is that one object was very compact and its mass was estimated to be about 1.21 times the mass of the sun. So slightly heavier than the sun. And as we saw, neutron stars are the remnants of the explosions of massive stars, composed largely of neutrons. And it has a companion star, which was very massive. 2.5 solar mass was the mass of the companion, 20.5. Now, during, during observations of the light curve or how the intensity varied with time, one also realized that for about 11 hours during this 2.1 day period, that no signal was seen from this object. What that means was that it is what is what we call an eclipsing binary. That means this object just went behind the other star, okay, companion star, and that is why you were not able to see any signals from it. If a system was face on, okay, if it was face on, then you would see both the stars all the time. For example, if this was, it was exactly on the plane of the sky, then you would see both the stars all the time. Okay, But this was an eclipsing binary. That means you're see seeing it edgeways. And so when you looked at the light, you would not see it all the time. When it is being eclipsed, you will not see it. So this was the eclipsing binaries are very important for estimating masses of objects. Because normally, you would not know the angle of inclination of a binary system, how it is inclined towards you. And that is important in terms of trying to determine the masses. We will see a little bit more of that when we go to estimation of physical parameters. And once this was realized that these X-ray sources were really in binary systems, it was soon also established that the score X1 is also a binary system. There is a neutron star of about 1.4 solar masses, and its companion is rather small. It's about 0.42 times the mass of the sun. So right now what you have are two examples of binary systems, both with a neutron star, which is a com compact object, but one where the companion is not very massive, it's less than the mass of the sun, okay? And the other is where the companion is massive over 20 times the mass of the sun. Now, the two questions we'd like to ask ourselves is, what are these objects? And possibly how are these X-rays generated? As we mentioned earlier, that X-rays are very high energy photons and you require energetic processes, particles at very high energies or, or temperatures to be able to generate this X-ray emission. SCO X1 would belong to what are called low mass X-ray binaries. And Sen X3 or Centaurus X3 would belong to the high mass X-ray binaries. And these are defined by just the mass of the companion star. Okay. Low mass, typically less than about two solar masses or so. And high mass, typically less than, greater than about 10 solar masses or so. There would be intermediate, there could be intermediate masses as well. And intermediate stars could also lose mass via stellar winds. 
and later evolve into lower mass stars, upper mass stars. Now, what I've drawn, shown in the figure over here, there's a nice sort of summary by Ramadevi, which is available in the web, is are the equipotentials, gravitational equipotentials, when you have a binary system, okay? We haven't done evolution of stars itself, so we will do that, or at least touch upon it later in the course. But stars evolve with time, and and they evolve into they can evolve into a stage where they fill up this gravitational equipotential. Okay. And this is what is referred to. These lobes are referred to as Roche lobes. And if it overflows the Roche lobe, then matter will be accreting by the companion object. Okay. In the high mass stars, in addition, what can happen is that just as the sun has a stellar wind because of highly energetic or radiation which is coming out from the surface of the sun, but more massive stars, which are more luminous, tend to have much stronger stellar winds. And the stellar winds, in addition to overflowing the Roche lobe, can be captured by the companion star. So what are, what are these objects? So let's just recap once more. These are binary systems with one compact star, which could be a neutron star, as we saw, which is the massive, left behind with a massive explosion of massive stars. Even more massive stars will lead to the formation of a black hole. And a white dwarf is the end product of evolution of a star like our sun. And the companion star, which could be a normal star or a white dwarf, orbiting about a common center of mass. Okay, matter being accreted from the companion or donor star. Is what we are saying are the characteristics of these low mass X-ray binaries and high mass X-ray binaries. And the X-ray luminosities can be extremely high. 10 to the power of 36 to 38 um, Earths per second is what I have noted over here. And you can see that this luminosity of an object like our sun, the, the solar luminosity, is about 3.8 times 10 to the power of 33 Earths per second. So you can see that these are orders of magnitude larger in luminosity in the X-ray region itself. So how is this X-ray, how are these X-rays generated? So as I mentioned, this goes and gets accreted onto the compact objects and X-rays are generated. So basically what is happening is that gravitational potential energy is being converted into radiation. For example, if you drop a pencil or drop a ball from a height onto a solid surface, what happens, what happens to it? Okay, it gets more tightly bound. Gravitational potential energy becomes more negative. Kinetic energy builds up and then it suddenly stops. So some of it can go into the internal energy of the system and some of it will be radiated away as heat. And we will see in more detail later that this is one of the very effective ways of extracting energy or generating energy uh, when via accretion onto compact objects. And Arthur Eddington worked out that there is a maximum luminosity that can be generated by this process. He considered spherically symmetric accretion. And the basic physics of it is very simple. That what you're doing is accreting matter due to gravity so the force which is acting on the matter which is being accreted is nothing but the gravitational force. So F is equal to G, M, M upon R squared. If, for example, plasma is being accreted and the object has a mass M, then you could put it as M into the mass of a proton upon the distance squared. Okay, G, M, M, B upon R squared. An ionized plasma will consist of protons, electrons, 
and traces of heavier elements, smaller amounts of heavier elements. Hydrogen will be followed by helium and the trace elements will be much smaller now. So for all practical purposes, we'll take it as an electron, proton plasma, and look at it. Now the other counteracting force which will happen is the force due to radiation. As you know from your basic physics, that radiation will exert a force, and that force is due to the Thomson scattering with the electrons, but, Thomson, but the electrons and protons will be coupled together. You know, plasma has to be overall neutral, so you can't separate them beyond a certain distance. And, and this Thomson scattering will provide the radiation pressure on the incoming photons. So the luminosity exceeds a certain amount, then the radiation pressure would be so large that accretion will stop. And Eddington calculated that out and showed that the luminosity is given by 1.3 times 10 to the power of 38 into m upon m sun, that is the mass of the accreting object in solar mass units, Ergs per second. So we saw in our case that the accreting object, a neutron star was about one to two solar masses. Okay. And if you put one to two solar masses over here, then the maximum luminosity you're going to get is a few times 10 to the power of 38 Ergs per second. So the observed X ray luminosities that you see are consistent with the maximum luminosity that you will get due to accretion onto a compact object. So this provides a viable scenario of trying to understand the X-ray luminosity of these binary systems. I've just shown you three examples over here of objects in the sky. Uh, and different types of companion stars. Usually they are, these are all um, X-ray binaries. And, and in these three cases, all the accreting objects are black holes. And from the properties of the binary system, you, there are estimates of the masses of the companion star. And in not all, but in number of cases, one also sees jets of plasma coming out from this accreting object. This is a similar phenomena to what we see in active galactic nuclei, as we mentioned earlier, while looking at radio sources, but they are obviously of much, much lower luminosity than the jets which are there in active galactic nuclei and which are powered by supermassive black holes of billions, billions, several millions to billions of solar masses. So these are in the tens of solar masses region, as you can see from this slide. So now we look at what are the other sources or possible other sources of X-ray emission in the sky. So this is a Chandra view. Chandra is the X-ray telescope, which has the highest angular resolution and really broke the sort of barriers in terms of getting high angular resolution. Uh, we will see later, again, the challenges of actually getting high angular resolution with X-ray wavelengths. We saw that by putting a telescope in space, the Hubble Space Telescope, you, would get, you could get about 50 milli arc second resolution or so, but X-rays telescopes is a different ballpark. And in this picture, what you see are several many small point sources, and most of them are likely to be X-ray binaries. Right, this is the plane of the galaxy, as I draw my cursor along. Sagittarius A, this is towards the center of our galaxy. This is where resides a black hole of a few million solar masses, Sagittarius A star. This particular object which you see is very bright, is, a, uh, is an accreting black hole in a high mass X-ray binary. This other object, which is also bright, is 
a, is possibly a low mass X-ray binary. And you can also see supernova remnants over here. There's a supernova remnant which is shining in X-rays. Supernova remnant 0 0.9 plus 0 0.1. This is given in galactic coordinates over here. And you can see that the X-ray sky is also extremely rich. This was where we talked about existence of an H2 region, but it, you can see it's relatively faint. It's one of the regions where there are very many massive stars so you can see that the kind of objects which we pick up in our own galaxy. And this is a more recent image, again by Chandra, and which has been observed by HST, Chandra, and Spitzer. And different colors over here denote the different wavelengths in which it is observed. The highest energy is corresponding to observations with the Chandra telescope at X-ray wavelengths. So this is the remnant of a supernova explosion in 1054, common era. And this was one of the earliest X-ray sources which was discovered. And supernova remnants are also easily detected. There are a lot of high energy particles over there in X-rays, although most are much weaker than the Crab Nebula. So these are the kinds of galactic objects which we see at X-ray wavelengths. These are some of the early discoveries. But when we make an all-sky survey of the sky, this was made by uh, E. Rosita, which was launched very recently in 2019. It's an instrument which was built by the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, an image made by the Imaging Telescope Array. And this was the first all-sky survey, which was completed in June 2020. And you can see that this is also in the soft wave, soft uh, extreme part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They've cataloged over a million sources. And what you find when you look at the whole sky is that the bulk of them are active galactic nuclei, where matter is being accreted onto not just objects of tens of solar masses or compact objects of tens of solar masses, but Objects which are accreting objects are black holes with many millions to billions of solar masses. So these are powerful emitters in the X-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We talked about the discovery of the quasar, the first quasar by radio observations. But if we were to look at the X-ray sky before radio astronomy started off, you, you would have discovered 3C273 in the X-ray part of the spectrum as well. So these quasars are very powerful emitters of high energy photons, X-ray photons. Then about 20% of them are from strong magnetic, magnetically active hot coronae. Okay. They're classes of stars which are very active and they have very hot coroning, even more active than that of our sun. There's also magnetic fields over there, strong magnetic fields. And these contribute about 20% of the X-rays which you see over here. They would have to be higher temperatures and more active than our sun. And, uh, and that you can see contributes much more than the binaries that we talked about, which really opened up the field of X-ray astronomy. Two percent are from clusters of galaxies. So I'll show you just one image of clusters of galaxies. And then there are X-ray binaries, supernova remnants, transients, gamma ray bursts, which we'll talk about when we look at gamma rays as well. But you can see the bulk of it are just active galactic nuclei. And these active galactic nuclei, we saw that in the ROSAT image, it made up the background, but ROSAT did not have the resolution to pick up individual active galactic nuclei, but realized that there was a diffuse X-ray background. This is an example of an active galactic nuclei. This is the 3C273, uh, which we saw had a wisp or a jet-like structure or a jet, 
And what I've shown over here are the images at three different wavelengths. They all overlap each other, but the detailed structures are different, which is related to the way the particles are accelerated, their lifetimes, the physics that is going on over here. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image over here where you can see a number of knots or condensations along it. This is in the X-ray region where you have two prominent peaks. There are extensions which you see in the optical which are not visible either in the X-ray or in the radio. This is a radio image of it. This has been made by the Chandra Telescope and this has been uh, made by the Manchester Radio Line Interferometer, which is an array of telescopes operating in England. The X-ray luminosities of active galactic nuclei have a wide range. You can see 10 to the power of 43 to 48 Earths per second. And we saw that the Eddington luminosity is 1.3 into 10 to the power of 38 Earths per second multiplied by M, mass of the equating object in units of solar masses. So if you had a 10 billion solar mass object, you could get energies of the order of 47, 48 Earths per second. And we know that there are these jets which are moving at relative steep velocities. And we'll, we have mentioned about synchrotron emission where ultra relativistic particles move in magnetic fields. But there's another process which is in operation called inverse Compton emission. Inverse Compton emission is where the photons get scattered by highly relativistic electrons to higher energies. Normally what you talk about or meet in physics is a Compton effect where photons can get scattered from electrons and atoms or free electrons and the electron gains energy and the photon loses energy. But here, where the electrons are zipping around at ultra relativistic speeds, you, may, you also have a situation where the lower energy photons can gain energy at the expense of the relativistic electrons and be bumped up to emitted higher frequencies. This is an image of Abel 69. You can interrupt me at any point. Today, I'm trying to go slowly. And if you have any doubts, just feel free to interrupt me at any point. This is Abel 1689, a very rich cluster of galaxies. And in this image, you can also see arc-like structures, for example, over here. Okay. So here. There's another here. Okay. There's a thin arc-like structure here. So you can see several arc-like structures. And these arc-like structures have been caused by the cluster of galaxies lensing due to gravitational lensing of background objects, background more distant galaxies. On the left, what the purple shows you is the X-ray emission observed by Chandra. So what you see when you see a cluster of galaxies, the galaxies are just a signature of much more that is going on in the system. The, the, the gas is in sort of rough thermodynamic equilibrium. Galaxies are also moving about in this general potential well, potential of the cluster, at velocities which could be very high, thousands of kilometers a second. And the gas is heated up to high temperatures and emit by the free-free emission process, which is basically electrons being accelerated in the coulombic potentials, largely protons. The temperatures could easily be about 100 million degrees Kelvin, definitely more than millions of degrees Kelvin. And they would emit at the high energies. So on the left is a Chandra plus HST image where the light colored are the galaxies, including lens galaxies, which are background galaxies. There could be other background galaxies as well, which have not been lens because they're too far away from the galaxy center and also galaxies in the cluster itself. On the right, actually, what is being shown in color is that to explain these motions of galaxies, to understand lensing, we need 
material which is not visible, matter which exerts gravitational influence, but which we do not see in any part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that we found was suggested by Zerki while studying the Como cluster of galaxies. And the right shows you a model of how the dark matter would be distributed to account for the observed properties. So if you take a cluster of galaxies, typically, that is also true of these Abel 69, a rich cluster of galaxies, that dark matter actually makes up most of it. Most, most of it, 80 to 90% of the matter in clusters of galaxies is dark matter. The hot X-ray emitting gas contributes much more than all the galaxies which you see over there. So you can estimate the mass of the X-ray emitting gas from the observed X-ray luminosity and the emission process which is emitting it, the luminosity of the X-ray. So you can go and estimate how much mass should be there. And that is that contributes about 10 to 20%. So you can see that the galaxies which you see, if you were visible only, if you looked at this cluster, only in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum, makes up only a few percent of this cluster. So this is just a recap that uh, the different processes we talked about in the X-ray region, black body radiation at millions of degrees Kelvin, two into 10 to the power of six. This is from a book by Seward and Charles. It's a nice book to read, exploring the extra universe, Cambridge University Press. Uh, and this is a site which actually gives you a very elementary introduction to X-ray astronomy. A site at Cambridge University. This particular figure is from Seward and Charles's book. So if you had temperatures which are very high from the Wien's displacement law, you can work out that you'd require objects of millions of degrees Kelvin. And as we mentioned earlier that, you know, for example, when the explosion, a supernova explosion leaves behind a massive object, that these, ob these objects could be in the X-ray ultraviolet or ultraviolet region, X-ray and ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum. The jet in 3C273, which I showed you, that is emitting, as I said, by the synchrotron process. Okay. Inverse Compton could also clear. Now, synchrotron emission has a power law spectrum. Okay. That means there are more electric, there are more intensity at low energies compared to at high energies. Okay. This is in a log log plot. Okay. So relative intensity would be proportional to energy or frequency to the power of minus alpha, the spectral index, and alpha would be plus one if you define it the way I do it. If you define it as proportion to nu to the power of alpha, it would be minus one. But what you can see is that as you go to higher energies, the intensity drops dramatically. This is ter thermal brainstorming emission. This is plotted for plasma at a temperature of 200 million Kelvin. It also drops quite rapidly at the highest energies, but over here, you can see it is largely flat. So the spectral signatures of the different emission processes are different, okay? And ideally, synchrotron process will also give rise to polarization of the emission, as we saw, in the radio region of the spectrum as well. We have talked about continuum emission, the three processes that are highlighted right now, but there is also line emission, which you can see at X-ray wavelengths. We saw that the Balmer lines or in Lyman alpha lines, Lyman lines, Lyman alpha is in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. The Balmer lines, H alpha is in the optical region of the spectrum. And if you go to very high quantum numbers of the hydrogen atom, for example, 272 alpha, 92 alpha, you will get lines in the radio region of the electromagnetic spectrum, 
because the energy transitions correspond to small energy levels, small differences in energy levels. Okay, now here you want higher energy photons. So you need the energy differences to be large. And that happens when you consider atoms of large atomic number. One of the very prominent, important lines and prominent lines as well is what is referred to as the K alpha line. Okay. In the n equal to one shell, the K shell. So it comes from the two to one shell and that is known as K alpha. Similarly from three to one, you could call it K beta. And this is a general physics site from Georgia State University, GSU, where I was just showing you that in addition to the Bremsstrahlung continuum over here at X-ray wavelengths. Okay. What you have are the prominent lines of K alpha and K beta. Okay. The exact frequency would depend upon the particular species that you're considering. Okay. In the cosmic composition, actually, for every 10,000 hydrogen atoms, helium is next most abundant, then comes carbon, oxygen, and the heavier elements, which are really much smaller. If you had, if you had a body or at plasma at lower temperatures, then to the power of less than 10 to the power of 6K, you'd see it in the ultraviolet, roughly of that order. And as you go higher in temperature, you go higher in frequency as well. If it is very hot that everything is ionized, then you will see more of a continuum and it will be more of a challenge to see the emission lines. One of the very important lines in X-ray astronomy is the iron line, iron K alpha line, F E K alpha. Okay. It occurs at an energy level of 6.4 electron volts. And why is it important? Iron is a trace element really, but the line is quite prominent. And the reason why it is important is that it is believed to arise in the inner part of the accretion disk of matter accreting onto a black hole. Okay. Particularly in the cases of these supermassive black holes, it has been invaluable in terms of understanding what is going on in the inner regions of the properties in the inner region of the accretion disk. Now, the iron line would be a line at 6.4 keV. Right? Now, normally, if the keV, the gas emitting it is stationary, then what you will see is a line at 6.4 keV, broadened a little bit by general random motions of the line emitting plasma. But what happens in a disk is that a disk is rotating. Disk is rotating. So one part of it is going away from you and one part of it is coming up towards you. So one part would be blue shifted, the one which is coming towards you. And one part would be red shifted, which is going away from you. So if you looked at this line entirely from a Newtonian perspective, what you would get is a line which profile which looks like this. You cannot go and resolve this accretion disk even with the best possible resolution. Chandra has about half an hour second resolution and you cannot resolve this. So, but you will see this line profile when you look at this region. Now there are, this is what happens with Newtonian physics. You may have done a little bit of special relativity and perhaps none of general relativity. So I will just describe it very qualitatively towards you. In special relativity, there is something called a transverse Doppler effect, which will actually shift the photons to lower frequencies. And the ones that are coming towards you, the plasma which is coming towards you, its intensity will be enhanced due to special relativistic effects 
and what and a line profile will look like this should look like this the coming ones will be enhanced and the receding one would be a little diminished the other aspect which comes in which is a general relativity effect that when photons are trying to escape from or get out from a body of where strong gravity of strong gravity region of strong gravity it is going to shift towards longer wavelengths to lower energies which is referred to as a gravitational redshift and the whole profile shifts towards the lower frequencies or the reddish part of the spectrum now if you add all these up the different effects this is the kind of line profile that you will get because of it occurring in a disk and incorporating the effects of both special and general relativity you'd be able to see a profile the profile would look like this and this is an observation of an actual galaxy an active galaxy okay mcg 63015 it's a it's an active galactic nucleus from which the iron k alpha line has been detected and you can see very clearly the profile which theory tells you now this is a very valuable to probe the accretion disk and also properties of the black hole so this gives you a glimpse of the kinds of objects that we study in the x-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum 